All right, let's get started. My name is Corinne Waldow. I'm the Economic Development Director for the Boulder Chamber. I want to welcome you to this week's food service, grocery, hospitality, and events session put on by Boulder County Public Health in partnership with your local chambers, economic development, and municipalities. I want to thank you all for being here to learn the safer reopening practices. There's a lot of updates for this section today, and we have an email ready to go to you to get your feedback on some uh, proposed draft guidelines. That'll all be covered today. But first, I'm going to hand it off to Jesse Rounds with Boulder County Public Health to kind of walk you through some general, um, some general areas. Thanks, Corinne. And thank you to the Boulder Chamber for helping us host this and get the information out there. So uh, today, uh, like the last couple of weeks, um, we're just going to give you sort of a lot of background uh, pretty quickly and jump as quickly as we can into the sector specific information that I think everyone is here to really hear about. Um, in terms of the timeline, we're, uh, while there's a lot of proposed uh, changes ahead, uh, right now they're, you know, we're, we're pretty much where we were a week ago. Um, you know, the, there, there, was, there were changes made recently to outdoor recreation, personal recreation, houses of worship, and personal services. A um, lot of uh, changes for events, uh, early on and, um, but really where we are is, um, and, and I'll get into this first bullet point in a little bit more, but, um, we're going to stick with this, uh, sort of slow opening measured, uh, approach for a long time. Um, and that is because there is no vaccine, there is no treatment. So it will be months, uh, though, as I say, and as the slide says, uh, safer at home will evolve, and it will evolve in fact to a new evolve in fact to a new program. Um, and the reason for all that is COVID nineteen is still just as contagious as it was before. Uh, so, as of now, we're still encouraging everyone to stay home as much as possible. Uh, and and this is a new point that uh, I think I really want to drive home for everyone, and that is there have been a lot of small uh, situations where um, either employers uh, feel that they need to pressure their employees to go to work or employees feel pressured to go to work. And we really want to encourage everyone, if you have employees who are f experiencing symptoms, please have them stay home. Uh, it's, it's one of the best ways to reduce the chance of spread. Um, and then in terms of compliance, uh, and this is especially true as we go into new phases and as we change guidance, please contact an attorney if you have very specific questions. They're the best who can, best source of information for how your plans can comply with the larger context. A uh, little bit about face coverings. Um, we have provided, uh, along with the chamber, face covering guidance uh, in a very nice chart for both employees and patrons. And as we brought out last week, there is a new face covering script. Uh, a lot of uh, employers uh, have been experiencing uh, trouble with people who come to a business and say, I'd like to come in, but don't have a face mask. And this helps you address some of those concerns. Are there alternative ways to provide the service that you have uh, without allowing people uh, in who don't have a face covering? Um, where to go for, for information? This slide really hasn't changed in a long time, and that's because these are the best sources of information. Um, the COVID19.colorado.gov is the state's website. That's where uh, they try to keep up to date with all the things that they're changing constantly. On our website, we're um, trying to link more and more to that uh, Colorado website, but there are Boulder County specific resources that we want you to be able to access, like that script like the face covering graphics, like all the um, materials that the, the chamber has turned into printable signs, those are all available through our website. Um, and then there are all these other sources uh, of information as well as resources like Energize Colorado is a great place to find cleaning supplies and masks and PPE, that sort of thing. Um, last week, we sort of focused on the process for outbreaks. Um, this week, I want to give you an update on actual outbreaks and how this is going to have an impact on our uh, future. Um, 
In the last week, there have been three confirmed active outbreaks, three suspected clusters, uh, and two unresolved outbreaks. Um, and uh, to date, 45 workplaces have been assessed uh, within the past six weeks. That's our epidemiological team. They actually work with our workplaces, work with individuals who are sick to try and um, figure out the best way to uh, protect both the sick employees and the, the workplace. Um, we really want to drive home how to reduce the risk of workplace outbreaks. Conducting those daily health checks, those are required for most industries. And so they really do need to continue and you need to be keeping track of that. Um, if you have sick or symptomatic employees, please have them stay home again. Uh, it's really important to look at your business model and see where are the points, where are the uh, instances where it would be easy to transmit uh, COVID-19. And those are the areas you really want to focus on. What are, what are ways that the state and the county can help you reduce that risk. Um, cloth face, face coverings, again, uh, for both employees and uh, guests. Uh, social distancing is really the best way to keep this um, uh, in check. Uh, improving building ventilation, um, th there have been a variety of resources out there, not all of them hugely helpful, but really, if you have the ability to uh, introduce fresh air into your system or increase the fresh air flow into your building. Since we're in the in the summer months, uh, this is a this is a workable solution now. Um, not everybody has control over their ventilation system, and I understand that renters are you know at the mercy of the the landlord in terms of ventilation. But speaking with your landlord about how to improve your ventilation, it's an important step. And then finally, please report any confirmed COVID cases to us. Um, we have an epidemiological team that can reach out to the employees work, and we work with the businesses and this is not a, you know, it's not a situation where we will close you down. What we're looking for is a way for you to operate safely while we protect your employees and your customers. So after the news about the, the, the new outbreaks, uh, variances have been uh, the variance really um, has been thrown into a bit of a, a tailspin uh, because to apply for a variance, to receive a variance, we have to have certain benchmarks at the county level in terms of number of new cases, uh, hospitalizations, that sort of thing. And because of the outbreaks, we actually no longer qualify for a variance. However, we uh, are seeing this as an opportunity to get ahead of submitting a variance if we need to go that direction. And to that end, the link here uh, is really a great way for you to continue to provide us with your ideas and guidance so that when we do get to the point of being able to submit uh, a variance, we can do that. Um, and uh, like I said in the past, uh, at, the, at the last uh, conversation about this, the variance process takes time. So the more we have now, the better we can develop a um, variance that will cover everyone. Um, and I guess that's, uh, there's a point on here that I think I do want to um, reiterate, and that is businesses don't apply for, uh, for variances. The county applies for the variance from the state regulations. And what we're trying to do is a blanket variance. So we're not going to apply on behalf of a series of businesses. We're going to apply on behalf of the entire county to try and create a, um, a single standard or a, a small number of standards that it will be easier to understand. Um, but again, we can't apply for the variance yet. We're waiting for the latest figures to show that we can before we do apply for any variances. Uh, and then the, the big news that came out yesterday from the governor's office, uh, there is new draft guidance. Uh, and this is a chance for you as business owners uh, to supply feedback to the state. The state is uh, promulgating these new regulations. Um, we expect that we'll see new regulations maybe on uh, Friday. 
Um, but please provide your feedback to the links, uh, the, the feedback links that um, are here. And also Corinne's gonna provide them in an email following this presentation. And they're due by the end of the day tomorrow. <laughs> Excuse me. And um, you see the three subjects there. They're looking for information there. Those cross a lot of, uh, at least the indoor and outdoor events, affect a lot of businesses. Um, and then the other big piece of news was that the state is rolling out uh, a future program called Protect Our Neighbors. Now, like the variance request, there will be a set of requirements that the community needs to meet before it can apply to the state to become, uh, to, to move to protect our neighbors. And this is really an evolution of safer at home, which was an evolution of stay at home. Um, and, and they have a framework that they've developed that they want comments on. So just like the um, updates, this is a draft document. Uh, they're looking for feedback by the end of the day on June uh, on Thursday. Um, and I think the, the really big thing, the key piece of information here is you're gonna provide feedback, they're gonna work on, the state is going to work on a draft set uh, uh, or a draft framework. And then it's unlikely that there will be any changes other than, uh, you know, this big a change won't happen until July. Um, so we have that time as a community to stay safe, be smart about interactions and get our case numbers down to the point where we could qualify for protect our neighbors in July. So um, this is not necessarily a, a time to rush to that, but we need to be very considered about how we how we get there. And so um, please uh, provide comments, read the framework, see how it affects your business. And um, John and Zach will will get more into that uh, in the next couple of slides. So Zach, thanks. Hey everybody, thanks Jesse. Uh, so this is Zach Lusgarden with Boulder County Public Health. Um, I work in the food safety division and um, if you've been following these uh, webinars, I've been here five or six weeks now. Um, in the last couple of weeks, really nothing has changed on the um, food service front. So that's good and bad because we do have a clear understanding of where we're at, um, but I can't really speculate on uh, as Jesse said, uh, in the weeks and months to come, we, this will evolve. But right now, all we have in food service is what we've had for the last couple weeks. Uh, we'll talk about one update at the end, but we'll just jump right into what the requirements are under Safer at Home. The big thing that we talk about a lot is that um, indoor dine-in service is held at 50% of the posted occupancy code limit or a maximum of 50 patrons, whichever is fewer. Um, and uh, we're just gonna hit a lot on social distancing and um, wearing of masks during this presentation. But the big thing here is that parties are sitting six feet apart. Um, your employees are all wearing face coverings. The biggest complaint that we get on the food service side of things is I went into a business and the staff is not wearing masks. They're not wearing their masks appropriately. Remember, these, these masks or face coverings need to go over your nose and mouth. So that's a big misconception that, uh, or not misconception, but just a big um, miss that we're seeing uh, from industry partners is that we have the facial coverings, but they're around your neck. And so um, the whole thing here is to build customer confidence. And in order to do so, a big part of that is gonna be wearing face coverings. We've seen that face coverings are a major way um, to prevent COVID-19 from being spread. So it's important that all your staff are wearing those masks all the time. I know it's difficult, but that's where we're at right now. Um, as Jesse also mentioned, um, maximum ventilation. So that's why we're gonna push outdoor seating as much as possible. But when you're indoors, um, just good working HVAC system and um, you know, not relying solely on your air conditioning. So if you have the ability to uh, open windows, um, we are gonna encourage that as much as possible. And then deep cleaning and disinfecting is going to be um, one of the major contributors here as well. Uh, lastly, parties need to stay together, can't let them mingle, so we're still in that same spot of indoor dining service. Moving on to outdoor dining service, 
if you can flip that slide for me. Thank you. Um, really, there are no restrictions here with occupancy. What we're relying on with food service requirements are still just social distancing. So tables are more than six feet apart. Um, and then again, like I said before, employees wear face coverings um, and you're disinfecting and deep cleaning all those shared surfaces. We've, we've kind of hit this uh, week after week, but work with your local municipality to get the authorization for extending your outdoor space. So we're seeing some really cool uh, concepts come out across the Denver Metro and we want to make sure Boulder um, is really taking Boulder County is really taking advantage of that uh, that offering to extend seating outdoors, uh, make it a really um, kind of best of the worst situation here. And then moving on to our next slide, uh, party sizes eight or fewer. And like I said earlier, reducing congregation any way possible. So no communal seating, no self-service stations, so no uh, soda, uh, dispensing stations, uh, no self-service, okay? So you have to have your staff dispensing that beverage or food from a buffet. So if you have a buffet, buffets at this point, we've talked about it quite a bit over the last couple of weeks, there should be no self-service buffets. Along with that, no seat yourself situations. And if you have a bar in your restaurant and you have a bartender who is using that space to prepare food or drink, then you cannot sit folks at that bar. This is uh, a question that continues to come up, but if you want to use the bar as seating for your patrons, then you may not at this time prepare food or drink from that same space. So you'd have to find an alternative situation to create those drinks and food and probably in the back of your restaurant. Um, and we'll, we'll harp on this quite a bit, but markings to create proper distancing and flow uh, of traffic throughout your restaurant. So that's the, the main spots would be your cashier station and even restrooms. Um, also outdoor spaces. When people are waiting to get in the restaurant, you should be clearly marking uh, the, the sidewalks. So you don't have people elbow to elbow waiting to get in because that's just, uh, it's, it's the same situation as indoors. You, you, we need to just create social distancing. Um, and then if you have uh, tables that are uh, closed, you need to just make sure that those are um, labeled as such. Signage, um, again, this is, uh, we've talked about it quite a bit, but uh, the more signage, the better. Um, you wanna increase cleaning and disinfecting protocols. Uh, post your cleaning logs. Uh, if you have menus that are multi-use, you really wanna move towards either menu boards or online menus. You wanna just have contactless uh, situations so that the less hands that are touching shared objects, the better. Um, if you have the ability to move to single use or single serving condiments, that would be uh, ideal. And then restrooms need to be cleaned and disinfected every hour and blocking off stalls and urinals um, with proper signage to ensure that you have six foot of distance. Provide hand sanitizer, check in and check out areas um, and throughout the venue. This is a oh, back one for me, please. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, another big one that, uh, that we've talked a lot about is um, if you have uh, games or, uh, uh, yeah, we'll call them board games uh, or dart tables, pool tables, shuffleboard, things like that, you want to remove those. Those are, again, those uh, high touch points, and that's what you just have to stay away from uh, in, in this current situation. Uh, if you have tablecloths, tablecloths uh, should be discontinued. Um, all of your silverware should be wrapped and uh, placed on the table with patrons. Um, the, and tablecloths obviously removed uh, between patrons if you feel that you can, you know, still utilize the multi-use ones, the, the cloth. They just have to be laundered between customers, between patrons, between parties. Moving on to our next slide, employees, the big thing here is we want to, as Jesse touched on, uh, we want to keep sick employees out of the workplace. So 
um, implement these symptom monitoring protocols and temperature monitoring uh, if there are any uh, symptoms of COVID-19. Then you want to ask those folks to, to stay at home and isolate. Uh, there should be someone on your staff that is monitoring uh, your staff, your, your own staff, and public for adherence of these safety measures. So if you're a quick casual restaurant um, and you don't have someone appointed to, uh, to seat folks, uh, you know, if you're normally a um, go through the line, get your order, and go sit down, you have to make, uh, you have to make some changes in order to make sure that tables are cleaned and sanitized between uses and you don't have folks uh, congregating and sitting too closely to one another. And obviously we're just uh, wanting to maintain six feet of distance between um, all employees at all times. We've talked about this a little bit uh, over the last couple of weeks, but shift cohorting, staggering of shift, shift changes and break room situations. Th what this is talking about is you just want to minimize staff interaction. So uh, six feet of distance in order to make that happen, um, less people in the kitchen at the same time. That's, that's going to go a long way to prevent that. So if you did ever have an individual on your staff that got sick or had symptoms, there would be a minimal amount of folks that, that may have exposure because um, one sick employee could put your business in a tailspin if you have too many folks too close together. And the big thing here, like I touched on, is if folks aren't wearing masks, that's going to be the biggest thing for you. Um, same goes for all vendors that come into your restaurant. So uh, you get food deliveries throughout the day. Those folks need to have face coverings as well. Um, gloves should be utilized for your customer facing staff okay um, but the back of the house uh, folks we're just really looking at basic food safety principles here so gloves are used with ready foods um, and then we're washing our hands frequently whenever they're soiled um, and in this situation what the order says is that uh, you need to encourage frequent breaks and at least every 30 minutes people have to wash their hands and obviously uh, in uh, arrival and departure as well Like I touched on, um, we go off the Colorado retail food regs. So there's really nothing that's changed here. Uh, you don't work when you're sick. You wash your hands often, change your gloves between uh, different tasks, and then um, use a fresh pair of gloves uh, after each hand wash. Uh, folks think that when they wear gloves that they're invincible. But if those gloves go everywhere with you, they go to... Um, to take out the trash, to touch all your dirty surfaces, including your face, your nose. I mean, even that face covering, uh, those gloves need to be taken off hands washed, okay? So they, they don't make you invincible. Other than that, I think these other points have been here for a while, but um, if you have the ability to, please provide your staff high quality face coverings. That's another complaint that really uh, has been coming in quite a bit, is that we're seeing staff report their own facility, their own restaurant, because they aren't being given the proper PPE to feel safe in the job that they're doing. So uh, please, please do provide high quality face coverings to your employees if possible. So for customers, uh, you do have to have a sign-in system that facilitates notifying uh, folks if there is an exposure that occurs. So um, reservations are an ideal situation there, but also just like when you come in the door, sign-in situation, okay? Technology solutions, you wanna look at mobile ordering and menu tablets, uh, text on arrival for seating, and then contactless payment options. Waiting areas should be outdoors. And again, like I talked about earlier, six foot distancing and markings to encourage social distancing. Uh, I touched on this earlier, but it's sit down only. Um, the order is very clear that there's no standing or congregating in that, especially in those bar areas. Again, another complaint that's coming in again and again and again is the bar area is being used to serve drinks, serve food, and you have folks congregating and standing elbow to elbow at the bar. So this all goes into customer confidence. Um, we want to prevent any kind of COVID-19 spreading situation coming from your restaurant. And this is probably the riskiest place for it to happen because it's just a natural tendency. If you have those places open, people are gonna stand, people are gonna talk, they're gonna 
intermingle, and that's what we're trying to prevent in this stage. Um, another big hard one is requesting facial coverings being worn by customers when they're not eating and drinking. So uh, Boulder County uh, requires facial coverings in public. So uh, folks should have them available. And if they're refusing to wear them uh, when they're waiting in line, coming into your restaurant, really any other time other than eating and drinking, then you do have the right to ask them to leave. And again, this is all going to confidence of the consumer. One real quick safer at home uh, draft um, proposal is that bars will be reopening. Uh, that was in the governor's press conference yesterday. And it's, it's looking like uh, in this draft document that it would be 25% capacity or, I'm sorry, uh, my screen's blocking it, but, or 50 patrons, whichever is fewer. Okay, so that's um, the big change that comes out of retail food um, and the bars at this point. So with that, I'll pass it on to John and um, we'll answer any questions at the end. Good afternoon. Sorry, I had to mute, unmute everybody. Uh, I'm John Holsey from Boulder County. Uh, I'm going to touch on short-term dwelling rentals real quick. Um, this has not changed from the last couple of weeks, but I'll go over it anyway, just in case anybody missed it. Um, the basics are that owners are responsible for ensuring that the property is clean and sanitized between guests. Um, it's uh, recommended if you can to avoid scheduling back-to-back -back stays. Try and keep that 24 hours in between stays so that you can make sure you have proper time to clean and disinfect everything. Uh, to try and provide a no contact check-in and check-out if you can. You know, think of creative solutions through technology, lock boxes, these sorts of things. Um, and if you do have to have some in-person contact, make sure to wear that face covering with any interactions with your guests uh, or their staff. Uh, you need to inform the guests of Boulder County's face covering order. They be, could be coming from some place that doesn't have such a thing. So uh, it's, it's important to remind everyone what our uh, uh, current order on face coverings is in Boulder County. And then have a flexible cancellation policy. You know, it, we don't want somebody coming to, you don't want somebody coming to your rental uh, that's feeling sick just because they're worried about not getting their money back. That creates a, could, could potentially create a bad situation. So, um, Thank you, sorry. Um, yeah, here's some uh, the, the short-term uh, rentals on, um, uh, excuse me, the guidance for the short-term rentals on the state's website as well as the CDC's website can be found here. And then I'll get to next what I know people are more concerned about today, uh, events, because there were some large updates uh, since we've all less last met and we've heard from a lot of you in the events industry. So I'm gonna give some very broad brush overview or broad brush overview. Uh, I'm sure there'll be some things that I missed. So feel free to please ask those at the end of the session. And, and then also know that there are some pieces of this that haven't been quite fleshed out yet and we're still working on them. So I'm gonna go over everything as best as I can though. Uh, so I'll start with life right ceremonies. Uh, they tie into places of worship. I, I touched on this last week, but I'm gonna to touch on it again today. Uh, life rite ceremonies are things like baptisms, graduation ceremonies, bat mitzvahs, funerals, anything like that. Uh, it doesn't matter if it's religious or not, but um, they all have the same guidelines. Uh, indoors, those are limited to up to 50 people or half of the venue's capacity, whichever is fewer. Outdoors, um, up to 50 people. Uh, Boulder County Public Health is telling everyone to just follow the state's guidance and go about your merry way. You know, have a, have a safe uh, life right ceremony. If it's over 250 people, we're asking folks to please submit a plan. And you might ask, what would we like to see on that? plan. Um, well, uh, we would ask that you first please read uh, the state's guidance because it has pretty much everything that we want to see in there, but I'm going to go over them real quick just for clarity's sake. So um, if you're having more than 50 uh, participants outside for one of these life rights ceremonies or, or really you know, any event, and we'll get to that here in just a second, what we want to see um, are 
Um, how many people are you going to have? Um, you can go up to 250 people. At this time, we're not going to approve any events with more than 250 participants. Uh, and the maximum number of participants is limited to the size of the space. So uh, if you look at the draft guidance from the state, they have some um, space requirements that, that outline the basic size. Um, I have it on the next slide and we'll get back to that in just one second. Um, but we also want to know where is this going on, you know, please let us know if you're in a city or in the unincorporated county and then provide a basic map of the venue. Because um, we want what we want to see in particular are what are your circulation patterns for when people arrive and when they uh, exit the event and how they're going to move through the site with uh, while maintaining that six feet of social distancing. Um, in these outdoor events in particular, you can sit um, a party together, you know, you have a household mom, dad, uh, son, daughter, they can all sit together without any distancing, but that party still needs to be distanced uh, six feet from other uh, households. So that's where things uh, will get a little bit tricky here. Um, we're going to want, if, if there's a food service, we're going to want a seating plan that it, adheres to all restaurant and food service protocols. Um, and, and, and then, you know, some other things like how are you going to clean high touch surfaces and restrooms? Um, and what, what is your symptom, uh, symptom screening protocol? How are you going to make sure that, uh, someone who, you know, maybe was, uh, not feeling so well, you know, you're going to ask them a simple set of questions, are you going to be taking temperatures, what's your, your protocol for trying to keep uh, folks who may be uh, sick out of the event. Um, so the draft guidance uh, for indoor and outdoor events, and sorry, can you back up actually, I, I forgot to mention what this kind of covers. So this draft guidance that I'm about to go over for indoor and outdoor events. So this, this indoor and outdoor events is really directed at anything that hasn't been defined yet. So uh, I mentioned life right ceremonies, weddings, funerals, those kind of things. Those are going to be covered under that, uh, the guidance I, I briefly just talked about. Um, this draft guidance is going to cover everything else. So receptions, events, concerts, fairs, rodeos, anything on this lovely long list uh, included but not limited to uh, is going to be in here. So this guidance is not finalized yet um, and it, it, we encourage you to please provide feedback to the state by five o'clock tomorrow. Uh, we have several links in here and um, I believe Corinne's email is also going to have the same links um, for you to please provide feedback. Uh, because we at Boulder County Public Health are really going to uh, you know, let the state's guidance take the lead. And then again, we, we're just kind of filling in some of the gaps where it says, look to your local authority for guidance. Well, we're trying to get those answers to you. So um, John, John, before you go on to the next slide, can, yes. um, can we get some clarification on that over? Is it up to 250? So between 50 and 250, you submit your plan? And not yes, over yes, sorry, that is a typo. I believe that's my fault. So I'll take ownership for that. Uh, sorry about that. It is uh, up to 250 people. And uh, we at this time are not going to per permit any event that's over 250 people. So sorry for that uh, confusion, everybody. Um, so this is what the draft guidance looks like. Um, you know, I'm not going to read through all the numbers. Reading, reading through numbers gets kind of boring. But um, th this is, again, straight copy and pasted from the state's website. So please, please provide feedback on this directly to the state. And, you know, and, and I really encourage everybody to read that state guidance. Um, there, there's really a lot more than we, I, I really like to go into detail uh, in this guidance today. But the basics are, are similar to what I just said on life right ceremonies, to be honest. It's making sure that you maintain that social distancing, making sure that you uh, isolate households from each other. Um, Jack mentioned it back in the in the bar and restaurant section about making sure there's not really an opportunity for households to mingle. Uh, you know, an example I can think of that's really easy to relate is at a wedding reception, it's okay to have the dinner and it's okay, um, you know, have some people together, but, you know, not, no dancing uh, as a great example. Um, you know, I kind of think of this jokingly as the footloose rule. Um, you know, un unfortunately, that's kind of where we're at right now. So no dancing for right now. Um, and then once the state's guidance has been finalized, uh, we're going to have some updated guidance, uh, updated guidance documents uh, for the events, uh, the life rate ceremonies, 
special events as a whole, places of worship. Uh, basically, th there'll be one document that's gonna be life rite ceremonies and places of worship, and then the other one will be for all other special events. Um, and so I'm anticipating having that uh, by the uh, end of the week. Um, that's my goal. Um, I apologize in advance. If for some reason the state doesn't finalize their guidance on Friday, I won't be able to finalize my guidance uh, on Friday, and that'll be, uh, you know, uh, released early next week, but I certainly think that by the time we have this call next week that we'll have some actual guidance that's been released to talk about rather than a bunch of speculative stuff. So um, so I, I think I just mentioned this, uh, the status of weddings. Our current guidance is found here. It's uh, in all honesty fairly out of date at this point. Um, uh, so if you have some questions about that, please you know, feel free to reach out to me directly um, because uh, it, it really has been superseded by both this life rights ceremony guidance and the draft guidance that's been issued by the state. Uh, Jesse, you're muted. <laughs> uh, thanks. No problem. Um, just, uh, remind everyone that we are going to continue to have these uh, sessions, uh, especially as guidance changes. Um, we got um, a full slate of industries on Tuesdays. Uh, the Latino Chamber has a rotating set of um, subjects that they uh, hit on at 6 p.m. And, and on Wednesdays, and that's a partnership between Boulder County Public Health, the Latino Chamber, and uh, the Boulder Chamber of Commerce. Um, and so they actually are recording those and saving them. So if you want to go back, if you missed a session, although again, we're going to have to hit all these things again as, as uh, guidance changes. And then Thursdays at 1 p.m., uh, we're having a general Q&A session, Corinne and I, and, and a rotating panel of guests. Uh, just um, interested in hearing what concerns and ideas you all have. Um, and with that, um, let's jump to Q&A. Um, and this is our email address and the phone number if you have any questions. Um, the phone number goes to our call center, so that'll be forwarded to us uh, sort of indirectly. The email comes directly to us and um, we can respond pretty quickly. So with that, uh, happy to answer. All right, Jesse, let's do the Q&A. Uh, real quick, that Thursday session, if you want to do live Q&A, we got a lot of feedback that people want to just have conversations uh, with the Boulder County Public Health and that's your opportunity. We do bring you over as a panelist and you can have live Q&A with Jesse, myself and some others. Um, and we don't record the Thursday sessions. Those are just additional opportunities to, to dive deeply into some of your questions. All right, so John, this question's for you. Are the square footage requirements for indoor and probably outdoor events mentioned in the draft guidance based upon the entire building or specifically the room or the, the specific area for the event? I am not sure actually. Um, I have not had a chance to dig that deep into the guidance to actually look at that. Um, I will see if I can answer that question while some of the others- I think it's have... pretty generic. It says facility <clears throat> and so you have some of these, these places that have you know, more than one room and indoor, outdoor, um, you know, will they be able to do both at the same time if they're if they're keeping those events separate? I think those are some of the questions that will need to be answered. In the yeah, yeah, yeah. I, I I can't say that I have that answer off the top of my head. Sorry. So for whoever submitted this, and probably several on the call, that's a that's a piece of input that needs to go in. And I yep, will I'm gonna, add. I'm, I'm going to copy some of these questions down so I know what to, I need to get back and answer too. Great. And I will add that the feedback submitted by businesses, and this is why we're encouraging it, has made an impact on draft guidances in the last couple weeks. Restaurants, big changes. Gyms, big changes. So give your feedback. That is very important. And I will send those links. I'll try to do it almost, you know, within, the, within 45 minutes of the session being over. All right. So I think this one's for you, Zach. In the past week, we have seen the city of Denver flip-flop on whether restaurants can host live entertainment. Where do we stand in Boulder with regard to hosting live entertainment? Yeah, so as a restaurant, we've talked about this before. Um, where we're at with it is you can have entertainment indoors, okay? But what you have to consider is that um, their equipment and those folks go towards not only your occupancy limit, but also your square footage, right? So more 
um, equipment and entertainment type uh, stuff that's jammed inside of uh, your restaurant or, or your venue there, um, the less t uh, room you have for seating, okay? Um, it also is going to bring up a, an interesting situation, like John mentioned. Uh, he, he alluded to the, the footloose rule, right? Um, when, when you have live bands, folks are gonna wanna dance and um, dance floors are, are not going to be permitted um, in, in the restaurant, right? Uh, not only is it intermingling of parties, but it's also uh, it's sit down only. So consider those things, but there's nothing that says in, in the actual order from the state that we are adhering strictly to that you can't have entertainment. It's just, what does that entertainment bring on? So there's consequences to, to every, um, everything that you wanna put out there. Uh, as far as outdoor goes, um, again, nothing that limits it, but at the same time, it's, it's what is it gonna bring with it? So if I were a business owner, I, I would probably uh, look at entertainment options that aren't full, full rock bands, <laughs> full concerts. And when you get into the concert type situations in these outdoor settings, then we go towards that event uh, guidance. And we've heard of some hotels recently that would like to, um, you know, have their outdoor seating with, you know, when they're serving food, have, have, um, you know, bands or live performances. And that's allowed as long as they continue to keep people seated at their tables, continue to have social distancing, not convening around those and, and making sure that the, they follow all the regulations and rules that are in place already. Yep, you're allowed to tap your knee and smile, but just the no intermingling of, of parties. So maybe, maybe music with no lyrics. I'm, I'm just kidding. Um, so John, Boulder County is going to follow the state guidelines on indoor and outdoor events once they go final, correct? That's correct. And do we have any idea when they're going to take effect? Actually, can I offer a caveat to that? I, oh, I think, sorry. Uh, no, 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 I think it's right. I, I, but I, I just want to remind you that if they delay some of those guidelines to the protect your neighbors phase, we have to qualify for that protect your neighbors phase. So, uh, it, you know, if, yeah, if any of the guidance that we're seeing as draft now gets delayed to that, then it won't, we won't be able to necessarily immediately implement it at the state as they would at the state level. Just to comment. But let's say just like restaurants and some of the others, they put out draft guidance for indoor and outdoor events in the safer at home phase that we're in, you will follow the state in that, in that path. And then anything further that's tied to the protect your neighbors or protect our neighbors, um, that will depend on Boulder County's ability to qualify for that stage. Yes. Just clarifying. Yeah, no. So John, is the max size of a wedding 250 or 175? So this is where things get a little complicated and tricky. So a wedding is a life rate ceremony and that would be that up to 250. However, um, the reception or any associated party that falls into the outdoor events, which has that max limit of 175. So you may have, you very well could have a situation where the wedding ceremony uh, is permitted to have more guests than the associated reception party after hour, whatever you'd like to call it. And then over 50 people on a life right, you've got to apply or give, get a permit or give your plans to um, Boulder County Public Health. Will you have to do that for all indoor and outdoor events over 50 or is it the life right? Uh, we imagine that to be all uh, outdoor events over 50 people. And what, what I think a clarification that I, I meant to add in here that I didn't, I skipped over. So if you're an event venue, you have events all the time, you know, like maybe, maybe you have two weddings or three weddings in a weekend or more. We don't need necessarily want to see a plan for every one of those weddings. We want to see what the venue is going to do for that space, because it's likely in wedding space A, or, you know, maybe your venue has wedding space A, wedding space B you're probably going to have a very similar protocol for both of those ceremonies. So you don't need to send it to us for every single ceremony, but we would like to see how the venue is going to be laid out in general uh, for each one of those uh, wedding venue A, wedding venue B, whatever, and then apply that to all the ceremonies in your space. 
Will there be a specific process or form they have to fill out? Or are they just going to email their plans to you? Um, I am not sure uh, that we've landed on that answer yet. <laughs> Jesse, do you want to? Yeah, the, the way that um, we're, we're, we're still rolling that out. Um, either way, it'll be something that um, you'll be sending directly to our team, um, whether that be through a website or, or by email. Uh, and we'll clarify that uh, as soon as we have it ready to go. Yeah. So you got a lot of this guidance yesterday, similar to um, everybody else. So you, you're working to try to create the systems as dictated by the state in order to meet the requirements. So we appreciate that. And I know there, there are questions. As, um, as a reminder to people on the call, as soon as we have new information, if the guidance goes live and we have the links, we try to send those out as, as quickly as we have them. So we will we'll continue to do that with this industry, especially since you're, you're the industry that's kind of um, up in the air right now. We don't know when some of this is taking effect. All right, uh, Zach, I have a question about the bars, the 25% capacity or 50. Uh, when will that take effect? And do, do, does everybody have to sit? Do they still have to follow those, those other uh, regulations of the restaurants um, with that change? Yeah, so when it comes to bars right now, we can open as long as we're affiliated with a retail food establishment. We've, we've established that in previous meetings. Um, and under those re requirements, you're looking at 50% occupancy or a total of 50 patrons. So if you did not want to team up with retail food and you were just a bar, you'd be looking at 25% with a max of 50. And that's draft um, guidance right now. So it's important that you take a look at um, what's been rolled out uh, and give feedback. That's my understanding. Um, and where I saw that information was actually in the middle of Governor Polis's presentation, but I haven't seen it in, um, in text. So uh, it's coming. Um, and if I were a betting man, I would assume that it would roll out with the rest of uh, this guidance that is set to be completed by the end of the week. Yep. Okay. But you don't expect they're going to allow, based on every other industry, allow people to mix and stand and convene around the bar that's serving drinks and... Yeah, guys, this is still the, one of the most risky um, types of sectors there are. Um, and that's why it's taken this long for it to reopen, uh, along with, you know, casinos and things of that nature, um, arcades, uh, movie theaters, we're all kind of in that same really, really risky, really close proximity uh, type situation. And so, um, yeah, I, I foresee that the requirement is that it's sit down only. Now, um, it's going to be on that business owner. To, to enforce that and, and do their best uh, to prevent uh, outbreaks from occurring. Because as we talked about earlier in the presentation, outbreaks are happening, right? Um, and in many states around us, uh, we're seeing rising numbers. And so with this uh, gradual reopening, and especially with bars, um, it, it's just a really tricky part. So uh, take that into account and just remember that we are only, um, you know, uh, a couple weeks of rising numbers away from going back to where we came from. So we don't want to, we don't want to slide back. And we want to be able to qualify for the loosening of restrictions as a community, um, which we currently don't qualify for and, um, because of recent outbreaks. So, and this is not just one day, it's trends over periods of time. So again, consumer confidence, preventing those outbreaks, it matters to the community as a whole as well. Uh, real quickly about bathrooms and HVAC systems. I get more emails about bathrooms and HVAC systems than I think about anything else. If they are shared restrooms, so let's say your restaurant shares a restroom with another facility um, that has maybe different standards that's not cleaning every hour. Zach, which one do they have to follow? Um, it, would, it would be the more strict. Uh, that that's going to be the best bet. Um, it, obviously, you can reach out to to your own legal team, um, but that that would be my as a regulator, we would always go with the more strict. 
of, of so the two. So talking to your property owner about, you know, I know there's multiple facilities, but because our requirements are so strict, we, we need to we need to follow this once every hour. Right. Um, and then one final question for you, Jesse, HVAC systems. <laughs> we talk about this in office and manufacturing a lot, but um, where are some good resources to get on what a good operating HVAC system really is and whether or not you have to take advantage of that $3,000 add-in that your company may be, um, may be you know, offering you to kill the virus in the air? What, what, where are the go-to resources for that? So your best bet for resources for um, understanding HVAC are um, OSHA and um, uh, it's a, there's an engineering association called ASHRAE. Um, and I do American Society the of Heating and Air, and, and Air Conditioning Engineers or something. Yeah, something like that. <laughs> Nicely done. Um, but they, they, you know, they have been doing research to the point where they, they had done research with previous coronavirus outbreaks to try and understand how air movement affects infection rates. So they are the experts in this sort of thing. Um, and the downside is that their documentation is very technical. Um, so um, I, don't, I, I don't think it's our place to tell you whether an upgrade is a good idea or not. Uh, but I think um, looking to the system you have now, use the best filters you can install in that system. Uh, do not overtax your system or it will break and then you get no ventilation, that's even worse. Um, so, and, and as Zach said, outdoor air is the best. If you can get ventilation with windows open, that's really a great way. Uh, breezes move air particles, that's the deal. So, um, and fresh air is, is not being put through a filter, so there's no chance for the filter to fail in that case, if that makes sense. Yeah. One other thing that we've heard a lot of is make sure the filter fits your HVAC system. Yes. So yeah. uh, that's the key is, you know, it might be a top rate filter, but it may not be compatible with your HVAC system. So make sure yeah. that that's in place too. All right, we're at time. Again, I'm going to try to upload this video as quickly as possible and get the email out to the full group so you can submit your feedback on indoor events, outdoor events, and then this new Protect Our Neighbors um, phase that the governor has, um, has suggested. They want feedback on all of that. And as previous experience shows, feedback matters. So please do it. We will see you next week because I'm sure John will have a whole list of everything you have to go through and, and do um, once it's finalized. And Zach may have some updates on the bars or who knows what else comes out on Monday morning next week. So Thank you everybody for attending. Please continue to attend these, um, get the right information so you can safely reopen and build that consumer employee confidence. And we need to make sure we, we put a stop to those outbreaks so we can continue to look to uh, qualify for future, um, future lessening of some of these requirements. We'll see you next week. Thanks Corinne, thanks Zach and John. Thanks everyone.